everyone, my name is Margaret. I'm the historical customer and textile conservator in training. If this is your first time ever seeing me, welcome. This is my COSI Symposium, Costume Symposium 2021 video, which I hope will be helpful to all of you. If you're new here, I hope you stick around. If you are old here, thank you for sticking around. Um, we have fun. I do sewing projects. I talk about costume and conservation as the name would suggest and sometimes we just have a chill time flipping through an antique magazine. Today I want to talk to you all about shopping for antique dress both online and in person and some red flags and some green flags to look out for when you are trying to authenticate a piece. Now having a study collection of historic dress in your home is gaining some popularity for historical customers and of course dress historians and conservators, as it's nice to have original pieces around in, in order to be able to look at construction techniques that you wouldn't necessarily see in fashion plates or paintings or even in most photographs. I know my study collection has allowed me to incorporate historical techniques that I otherwise just wouldn't have known about. However, the task of buying these sort of pieces, both online and in person, can be somewhat daunting, as there are a million different things you need to look for in order to really be able to authenticate a piece as quote unquote true antique. This can be especially hard with historic dress because there isn't really a handbook for these sort of things. Dress is super varied from person to person, no two pieces are alike, and frankly, historic dress wasn't always seen as something useful or collectible, which means that a lot of historic gowns have actually been altered in the late 19th century and early 20th century for fancy dress or home use or what have you, making them more or less not true antiques. It's a fine line to walk, but I like to categorize alterations of dress into two distinct categories. Contemporaneous alterations, which are alterations that were made during the use life of the piece, in which the wearer of the piece maybe resized the garment for themselves or another, switched the style up, maybe added some trim, took some trim away, those types of things. Alterations that were essentially used to prolong the use life of the garment. These can be very exciting when you find them and can be enlightening as to how the garment was used during its lifetime. These don't necessarily distract from the piece. Then there's the second category, post-use alterations. These are alterations that were made after the use life of the object or the primary use life of the object and detract from the piece. These would be things like you know, someone in the mid 20th century going to a costume party and remaking an 1860s gown to fit them, taking out pleats and darts and putting in new closure methods and changing things up. Yes, I have a dress like that and yes, you'll be seeing it this in that video, but that sort of detracts from the piece's original intent and the maker's original intent and sort of masks that historical significance that we want these study collection pieces to have. So even though it's technically a true antique, it's been altered so that these historical aspects are obscured, making it less valuable to a collector in terms of a study collection. So obviously these things can be hard to parse apart when looking at photographs online or even when you're going in person, there are some tips and tricks which you need to look for. Of course, one way to make sure you're getting high quality pieces is to buy from a really great dealer. I'll pop some of my favorite dealers down below. However, this does come with a premium because they're doing all of this beautiful sourcing and packaging and all of this very nice stuff for you, you're going to be paying a little bit more. Nothing wrong with that, but if you're like me and you like the thrill of a hunt, you like a good deal, you're probably looking at places like Facebook Marketplace, eBay, Etsy, and out in the wild at garage sales, estate sales, and auctions. Of course, these places come with a higher amount of risk and building up your toolkit in terms of things to look for is always a good idea. I just wanna make a note here that most sellers online and in person do not have bad intentions when it comes to selling you antique clothing. A lot of them just either don't know what they have or don't have this amount of nuance in terms of their historic dress education. Throughout this video, I will be showing screenshots and examples of products for sale online. Please don't send any hate to the sellers of these items. That's not what I want out of this video. This video is not to shame any sellers. It is to empower buyers to make better purchasing decisions. Don't send hate to anybody. 
that's not what this is about. For these tips, I'm going to assume that you do not wanna buy garments with fancy dress alterations. We can talk about fancy dress alterations in another video later down the line, but we're just going to assume that it's not something that we want to be purchasing. And remember that historical dress is highly variable and that these tips are going to be seen more as guidelines than hard and fast rules. There are always going to be exceptions. I will note when they're not going to be exceptions, but most of the time there's going to be exceptions to these things. So we've broken these tips up into five categories, starting with the most concrete and sort of making our way to the least concrete at the end, those being tags, closures, fabric, sewing, and uh, the last category, which I have labeled style elements or quote unquote vibes, which we will get to. So let's start with tags. Historical garments are not going to have tags like our modern garments. If you see a tag on the back of the neck, most of the time, that is not going to be a historical garment. Just, it's not, it's not gonna be a thing. I've seen so many people putting antique on their listings when it is clearly a modern piece. So do not buy anything with modern tags. That is not, they're just not going to have them, but let's, kind of go into what that really means for a second. Late 19th century garments might have a maker's mark on their petersham. If it is a lady's bodice, the petersham is of course that piece of ribbon that sort of wraps around the waist to secure the bodice. They may have a maker's mark in there. Additionally, early 20th century ready to wear pieces may have a small tag with the maker on there. This is going to be a woven tag. These are going to be small tags. They're normally just going to have the maker's mark information and nothing else. No fiber identification, nada. The first notable person to quote unquote sign their work with a tag was Frederick Charles Worth in around the 1860s. So pre 1860s, you're probably not even going to see a maker's mark tag. And post 1860s, a lot of the time you don't see a maker's mark tag either just because that wasn't something that that particular dressmaker was doing or it may have been made um, in a home setting. So if you don't see a tag or a maker's mark, that's not a big deal. But if you do, it'll be a small woven tag or it'll be stamped on the Petersham. Men's suits often have this same sort of woven maker's mark in them as well. Fiber ID tags were not standard until the mid 20th century and the Wool Processing Act of 1939 was sort of the first time you're going to see that wool mark. So if you see that wool mark, it's 1939 or later. Um, wool marks are not, you're not gonna see those before that time period. I'm not gonna go through the rest of the regulations in the 20th century, but just know that the whole made in tag and the fiber ID tag, those are going to be two things that are specific to the 20th century into the 21st century. You're not gonna see those in the 19th century and you're not gonna see those at the very beginning of the 20th century. So the TLDR on that one is, if you see modern tags, not a historical piece. This one's pretty obvious, but I just wanted to state it because I have fallen for this. Back in my beginning baby days of historical collecting, I did fall for this one. So learn from me don't do it. Moving on to closures. Closures basically meaning the way that the garment closes. This is a dead giveaway on many pieces, so pay very close attention to the closures of a garment. 18th century garments, if you're collecting at that level, would close with ties, buttons, hook and eyes, and sometimes even just pins. 19th century garments, we're also talking sometimes ties, a lot of hook and eyes, buttons, and then also sometimes lacing as well. Hook and eyes have very distinct shapes moving throughout history. Our first category is pre-industrial hook and eyes. These are going to be about 1830 and back. These are either going to have sort of a hewn, iron worked appearance to them in the very early stages. There's also just pure brass wire ones and then sort of this flattened style as well that I've sort of um, seen in a couple of garments. The 19th century hooks, about 1830 to 1900, these are going to be super robust hooks that are going to have a wire base and then a flattened head. This will be very obvious once you see a few examples, which I will be putting on screen. Getting into the early 20th century, these are going to have the wire bottom as well with a slight flattening of the head, but not that extreme that the 19th century has. 
and once we move into the 1930s and into the mid 20th century, we're going to see the hooks that we are um, very used to seeing in today's modern world, they're just going to be the plain wire ones. No flattening. So if you see hooks on a 19th century piece that do not have a flattened head, most likely you're looking at a mid 20th century hook. Once you start to see more and more examples of these, it'll be easier to parse out what looks 19th century, what looks pre-industrial, what looks 20th century or modern. Now moving on to snaps. Snaps are honestly one of the biggest giveaways in terms of alterations. Snaps became popular in the 19 teens and they were used in the very, very late 19th century and that first decade of the 20th century, but very, very sparingly and they do not look like the snaps of today. Often they're chunkier, they sort of got a steampunky feel to them. I'll try to put in some examples, but they don't look like our modern snaps. Our modern snaps, that's going to be 19 teens into the 1920s. The side snap closure was very, very popular in the 1920s and 30s. So with that being said, snaps are a really good sign in the 1920s and 30s, but before that normally mean an alteration took place in the mid 20th century. I cannot tell you the amount of 1860s dresses I have seen that have snap closures to them. This is not period and this is the, a hallmark of a fancy dress alteration, an absolute hallmark of them. Next is of course the zipper. The zipper is a dead giveaway. Historic garments will not have back zippers. They just won't. Okay. The first patent for a zipper was filed in 1893, but the first workable zipper that we know today wasn't invented until 1914. They were originally used for leather jackets and other sort of more hard wearing goods and wouldn't really find their way into fashionable dress until about the 1930s, 1940s. So if you see a zipper before then, it's either a unicorn among unicorns or it's been altered or it's being just listed as something it isn't. This is also something I fell for early on. If you see a zipper and it states, you know, pre-1930, be very, very skeptical. And very obviously, Velcro. That is never going to be historically accurate. That was not invented until the late 20th century. So if you see that, she's been altered. It's good to remember too that a lot of historic garments were in fact rigged for stage use. So keep that in mind. So the TLDR enclosures is know your hooks. The flattened, the flattened head on a hook is going to be a great sign for a 19th century. Snaps are not going to be very popular until the 1920s. So if you see, see snaps before then, be very skeptical. Zippers are not gonna be popular until the 1940s. If you see a zipper before that, be very skeptical. And of course, Velcro is a no-go. Now moving on to fabrics. This one can be a lot harder to sort of parse out when you're looking online, but there are, if you know your fabrics and you kind of know what you're looking at and you build up that visual Rolodex in your head of what different fabrics look like and feel like, then this is probably going to be a little bit more helpful, but these are some general guidelines to look for. So obviously historic garments are going to be made of natural fibers. Those are primarily going to be linen, cotton, silk, and wool. There are other natural fibers that were used, hemp, different kinds of animal fibers. So it's not just those four, but those are the four you're gonna see most. Rayon is going to be our first semi-synthetic. It was invented in the late 1840s, but wasn't put into commercial manufacturing until the 1914, and then wasn't really in circulation and fashion until about 1920. So if you see rayon, if you feel rayon, it's that sort of synthetic silk rayon. Also acetate is kind of the same thing and was sort of invented around the same time. So if you feel that rayon acetate situation, 1920s, you know, 19 teens, that's going to be okay. Anything before that, you know, you, it's a reproduction or a costume or something. The first fully synthetic fiber was nylon, which was invented by DuPont in 1939. Obviously, if anything is in nylon, it's after that date. And if anything looks like it could be before that it is in nylon, it's not. So just keep that in mind. Same thing with acrylic and polyester. They were manufactured 
you know, after nylon, but again, you're not gonna see it before 1939. These are also the same general guidelines for thread as well. If we're seeing polyester thread on an 1860s garment, it's been altered. <laughs> Threads are a little bit harder to parse out and you would have to do some like burn test situation normally. It's not something you're gonna necessarily see on an online photo, but just keep that in mind. These benchmarks also are for threads. Something that you're going to see and is going to be a great green flag is that sort of tobacco colored or glazed cotton linings in bodices and skirts. This is a hallmark of the late 19th century, I think 1870 on into the first two decades of the 20th century. If you see that tobacco colored lining and or glazed cotton lining, that is a big thumbs up. It could still be altered, but at least that's original material and that's a big thumbs up. It's also important to note that synthetic dyes weren't invented until 1856. So if you're looking at something that's like Perkins purple or arsenic green, that is going to be after that date. If you see something before that, it's been altered or some, something happened there. Um, but that's just a good benchmark for dating. You're not necessarily going to see you know, weird things happening in terms of color. It's just one of those benchmarks. We gotta be like, 1856, aniline synthetic dyes. It's like a big thing. It's important to note that older garments can also be colorful. They're just not gonna be those specific colors of like Perkins purple or arsenic green or all those other really specific bright colors. This is of course something I can go into in a different video when I do more research on it, but it is just important to note. And of course, working out that visual Rolodex in your mind of what colors make sense and what colors don't make sense in terms of historical garments is going to help you on your buying adventures. Next, we're gonna talk about sewing. Both type of sewing, machine versus hand, and also quality of sewing factors into whether a garment is authentic or has been altered or not. So the first sort of workable commercial sewing machine was invented in the late 1840s. Before that, there were other sort of prototypes and things shifting around inside the universe. If you see machine sewing before 1849, it's either a unicorn among unicorns or it's been altered or it's a reproduction. So just keep that in mind. From my personal experience working with extant garments, I find that machine sewing sort of shows up, especially in America, in the 1860s. This is because the Civil War, there was a lot of industrial production being used to manufacture uniforms and things, so the sewing machine really got a boost in that period, especially in America. But in terms of fashionable dress, I tend to see machine sewing start in the 1860s and boom by the 1870s. So if I see a garment that's made before the 1860s, I will assume that it should be hand sewed. Although between like the 1840s and the 1860s, there is a possibility of machine sewing in there. Again, if you see hand sewing over machine sewing in a period after 1860, that doesn't mean a whole lot. People still did hand sew their garments after this. It did take a while for the sewing machine to disseminate throughout all the households, but you know, it, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just something to note. So TLDR on that. If you see machine sewing for the 1860s, be skeptical. If you see it before the 1840s, I would uh, be very, very skeptical. And if you see hand sewing in any period, you're, you're looking okay. Additionally, there is this factor of quality of sewing. So the sewing in antique garments isn't always perfect. There's in fact a lot of raw edges, but normally it's at least wearable. When you're doing contemporaneous alterations, the idea is that this is going to be worn. So it's not gonna be slapdash, it's not gonna be sloppy, and it's not going to be something that's really tenuous. These are alterations that are meant to hold, that are meant to look somewhat good, that are meant to stand the test of time. Things like taking in and out seams, you know, attaching a new collar, possibly resetting sleeves, revamping things, darning, mending. These sorts of things are going to fall into the camp of contemporaneous alterations. Post-use alterations, especially for fancy dress, are going to come in the forms of visible top stitching on hems, 
you know, letting things out in a way that doesn't make any sense, that highly alters the style, um, leaving raw edges on the outsides of garments, things that are just not going to stand the test of time and that don't particularly look good. It's not that they're done hastily, it's that they look bad. Like, they truly look bad. So you gotta look out for the quality of alterations as well. Again, if it's machine done on something that has been hand sewn, like you see hand seams, but then you see this really weird machine stitching in there, that's another hallmark of a post-used alteration. Slapdash, fancy dress, think I'm just gonna sew this quick for a party that I have to go to on Saturday kind of deal, instead of I want to wear this for another 10 years. So TLDR on that, contemporaneous men's normally have an amount of care in them, post-use alterations normally don't. Sometimes they do, but they normally don't. <laughs> and the last category which I have sort of put into this camp called style elements and vibes is basically just saying if it doesn't look right, it's probably not right. This instinct, this historical dress instinct, is something that you build up over a period of time just looking at different pieces, both online and in person, understanding what looks period and what doesn't look period. Sometimes you can just tell something is off. Just give it a vibe check and be like, this doesn't look old. That's honestly a, a very reasonable thing to think. It's like, this just doesn't look old enough which sometimes you're like pleasantly surprised. You're like, wow, that's in really good shape. And most of the time when you look at something, you're like, it just doesn't look that old. It's not. Basically what I'm saying, the more garments you can see and you can touch, the better. In order to sort of illustrate this, I'm going to go over a few examples in voiceover mode so you can sort of understand what I'm saying here a little bit better. So this first piece we're gonna look at, it was labeled as an 1890s transitional dress. And there is just something very wrong about this piece. As you can see, the vibes are just really off. Um, first of all, it looks like it's been made out of a 1970 chenille bedspread, um, which I think might be the case. Uh, the color is, is vibrant, and you can get that color in 1890, but it's pretty vibrant for 1890. The black bows are a little odd, and then the skirt is just, there's, at minimum, there's something missing. At maximum, this is an old piece of fabric that's been oddly pleated down, or potentially it's on backwards. I don't know, Some, something's been really monkeyed with this dress. Um, from the front, it looks like straight 1912. From the side, it looks like 1880. Um, so there's something going on with this dress. I really don't know what's going on with it, but there is also a weird, you, if you look close enough, there's a weird gusset under the arm of that tan fabric. So I would be very, very skeptical about this piece and I don't think it's from the 1890s. I, you know, a conservative opinion on this piece is that it is altered from different pieces of historical dress with my most wild theory being that this is a 1970 chenille bedspread that someone made into a historical costume. Now this dress uh, almost got me. So this is labeled as a late 19th century, early 20th century antique dress. It is just sort of your simple cotton sort of lingerie type dress. Um, just from looking at these photos, I knew something was off because the sort of paper bag situation that's happening at the waist, that is not particularly historical. And as I was looking through these pictures, I came across our Holy Grail. If you see those hooks right there, those are mid 20th century hooks, which means this has been altered. It was probably started out as a, you know, late 19th century dress, maybe even earlier, um, but now it is something uh, completely different. So keep an eye out for those hooks. They really are honestly one of the easiest ways to spot an alteration. This next dress is truly wild. It was labeled as an 1860s dress. And, um, you know, at one point it was an 1860s dress. This is a family piece, um, the family, said it was worn by their ancestor and they have documentation of that and I believe them. I truly believe them. They are just missing one crucial piece of information and that is that someone took a scissors to this thing in the mid 20th century. Um, as you can see the bodice was cut and then made into that little waist cincher and the real kicker here, the real kicker, is that a late 19th century, early 20th century shirt waist has just been spliced onto this poor, poor 1860 skirt. This would have been a real 
showstopper of a gown, but unfortunately now it is this odd Frankenstein monster. And to be fair, um, I kind of want this dress because it is so odd, uh, but I cannot justify the nearly $600 price tag. So for another day, I suppose. So one of the areas that you have to be really careful with is wedding dresses. There's a lot of them on the market. A lot of people save their wedding dresses. So there's a lot of families and, and people trying to sell them um, for either very reasonable prices or often sometimes high prices. But you got to be careful. This was labeled as an antique Edwardian high neck ivory silk wedding dress extra small. Um, if you read the description, it says that it's from the 1940s, which I agree with. So just be very careful, especially when you look at wedding dresses because they are often mislabeled. So hopefully with those tips, you can go buying historic dress online and in person a bit more confidently. If you have any further questions for me, you can pop those down in the comments. And remember, when you are a buyer buying something on a website, it is always acceptable to ask the seller for more information and even for more photos. If a seller doesn't want to give you more information about an item, it probably means that you don't want to buy from that seller. So just be careful out there. Ask the questions you need to. Think on it. Don't just automatically purchase something, especially if you don't have the cash on hand for it. I don't want you guys purchasing something that doesn't serve you in your study collection. I know it's happened to me a couple of times and that's never fun to get something in the mail and be like, oh, this isn't right. So I hope these tips have been helpful for you on your antique buying journey. My name is Margaret. Again, you can find me here every week. Hopefully we'll see with the upcoming semester coming, but you can of course subscribe down below for notifications when I post. You can like this video if you indeed liked it. You can follow me over on Instagram at Costume and Conservation, also at TikTok at Costume and Conservation if you choose to do so. I hope to see you in the next one and I hope you have a fantastic day. Bye.